what's up everybody i'm enjoying the incredible view out my window in bali indonesia right now it's 9 30 p.m and ashley and i are gonna record a q a for you guys ash how are you today I am fantastic. It is 8.30 a.m. The view outside my window isn't quite as exotic. There's icicles hanging down in front of my eyes, but it's a beautiful sunny day and I'm drinking my coffee and I'm happy to chat with you. So almost as good as what you're doing. So Ash, you're going to die when you see the place I'm staying in. Thanks. And I'm not- Thanks, friend. <laughs> so it's really funny how things work. So uh, I rented an Airbnb and the people who have are hosting me over here in Bali said, you know, the day that I got here said, Hey, Oh, we got a villa for you. You know, we want to check it out. And I was like, Oh, I already got one. It's okay. And goes, well, you know, here's the link anyways, if you want to check it out. And I was like, was it, this a joke? <laughs> like I have an entire, I don't know, probably <laughs> acre villa to myself oh, overlooking. I'm literally by myself <laughs> overlooking the ocean. Ash, you'll see, I'm going to post bit stories on my Instagram over the next few days. It's for sure the nicest place I've ever been in my life. That's I've been incredible. To some other yeah, yeah, it's going to blow your mind. Like, okay, you're going to get a lot of uh, good, I would think, meditation and like deep work done in a place like that. Yes and no, because I've got a staff of 20 people. <laughs> well, you can um, tell them, hey, like, Leave me alone for yeah, twenty yeah. minutes. <laughs> like, hey, my naked sunning in the morning is going to is going to uh, be impeding me. Is there? there will be some pictures of that on the internet at some point too. If you have got twenty yeah, people got wandering around, I've also got a full time <laughs> film crew, and they're like, "Oh, just I'm like, just make sure you don't get my naked sun, <laughs> my naked sun on." <laughs> it's funny. There but, might be some translation issues. They're like, "Make sure we get you naked." Okay, got it. <laughs> All over the internet tomorrow. Yeah. So anyways, I feel like I'm living the celebrity life for the next three days. And I wish I had people here to enjoy it with me because it's really never that fun by yourself. But yeah, well, you'll just have to make the best of it for the rest of us. Sure. I have a 24 hour chef and it literally about, I don't know if it's 20, but pretty damn close to 20 people staff. That's uh, and and I, I literally, I'm going to stay locked in my room, like afraid to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> just knowing they're there is pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Please do like, you know, record some of this and like, let us see what's going on because that's, that's one of the cool things. But what you do is you get to travel to all these amazing places and that's, that's part of the beauty of the work that you're doing this month. So. Yeah. So we're going to record the whole weekend, like everything we do. Nice. So we're actually going to do it tomorrow, which is the seminar day here at the villa. And we have a really nice conference room. We do it there and we'll probably end up going outside for a lot of it because midday is pretty damn hot, but we'll probably spend the morning outside, uh, do our meditation and breathing out there and then head back inside and you know, learn and, and make our way over to the gym back and forth. It's pretty epic, but you guys will get a great view on social media and uh, we are filming the entire weekend badass gym here in bali called body factory and i suggest anybody like it's an interesting thing i've never been to bali and i didn't realize how really amazing it is it's certainly uh, still a third world country but there's definitely some up and coming areas and just the fact that you know this amount of tourism helps the country i'm leaning toward doing more things here more often i really like it the people are super nice the food has been great so far, it's been a great experience. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, it's it's kind of cool to, it's one thing for you to be able to go to locations where a lot of people have expressed interest in learning from you and having the muscle camps where they are, but it's another thing to make them almost like destination places for people who want to learn from you and also want to get like this incredible cultural experience or go to a new place and go to a beautiful place. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Tampa, but like maybe I'll go to Bali next year instead. Like, you know what I mean? So that's, that's kind of a cool yeah. concept. And then you're helping people, you know, there and and the people who are coming. So it's kind of like a win-win for everybody. I tell you, it really got my wheels turning on what we could do next year to just make it exponentially greater, right? Like how can you get people a seven, five to seven day retreat where it's a getaway and that includes, you know, the breathing, the yoga, the meditation, the massage, the food, the workouts, the education, like all of it. So we had someone reach out to do one of those in Iceland next year, actually now this year in 2020. So I'm thinking I might do one here in Bali as well, depending on the seasonality. The weather here now is pretty damn awesome. So as long as we're avoiding the rainy season, I think it's a super idea and these guys are down for it. So uh, definitely look for that in the future. Again, I would move heaven and earth to come to something like this. Again, especially considering the people who I know will participate or I know that will teach. It'll be just be epic. That's incredible. Okay, so I have a, a softball question that's related just to get us in. I know we have to do a short podcast today, but you do get a lot of questions about being a parent and your kids and, and that kind of thing. And this is just sort of an easy one. But since we're talking about beautiful locations, you got a question on social media about 
the best place you've ever taken your kids on vacation and why and why they liked it and why you liked it? Oh, Maine. There's a really great all-inclusive place in Maine called Migus Lodge, M-I-G-I-S. Absolutely epic and amazing destination place for families. So you kind of get your own little cottage on this. You know, it basically looks like the what Dirty Dancing would have been, right? You kind of yeah. have this like compound. Cool. You have this compound where you get like your own cottage and you're overlooking an amazing lake and they get all the water sports and there's a huge kids area and like kids didn't ever want to leave the area. Like I was like kids, like I want to spend time with them. like, no dad, go away. <laughs> like, okay. And then, you know, with your, with the adults get to do a, you know, semi-formal dinner, like guys have to wear a jacket and women, women wear like a cocktail dress. And so they really kind of do it up. So you can actually have date nights every night while your kids are babysat and, it's pretty awesome. And the kids every year go, Dad, are we going back to Mike's Lodge for the summer? And I'm just like, uh, super expensive. But if it's within your budget, I would highly recommend it. Wow. I would never have thought that you would say like New England is one of the coolest places, but that does sound pretty awesome. Yeah. But you're disconnected, right? No TV yeah. or anything like that. I mean, my thing is like, let's get outside and do stuff outside. They have a really cool gym. It's actually outdoor, obviously only open in the summertime. All the water sports you want. I did my, I did water skiing for the first time. I almost tore both my hamstrings, <laughs> but 30 pounds. Worth it though. <laughs> oh, it was great. Yeah. Um, I did some interesting stuff. It was fun. I had a blast. And the kids just every year are like, hey, we're going back. And, you know, it's actually, I'm, I'm very grateful you asked that question because I'm planning out our summer now. And planning them probably a month in Banff. I mean, Banff and Jasper, I love it up there. I know the kids enjoy some time in the, in the uh, mountains. But Mike's Lodge might be one that's on the radar as well. Very cool. I have a couple quick questions related to the podcast that just came out with Dr. David Sinclair. I want to keep this like as timely as possible because people were really into that episode and people had some questions. And the first one, I kind of want to weigh in really quickly and then you can add to it. And it was somebody commented in the comments of the post about that episode and a few people liked it, which kind of surprised me how interested people were that people didn't know about this, but they were asking about taking notes on your podcast. So you hear it all the time that people are like, your guests are incredible. Like there's so much information. I got to take notes. I'm going to go back and listen again. And someone actually commented and said like, how do I take optimal notes on your podcast? And I was like, that's interesting. There were people that were actually like really questioning how they can get the most out of your podcast. And I just wanted to weigh in as a nerd and someone who's been in school a long time and takes a lot of notes and just sort of my kind of thoughts. And then we'd be happy for you to sort of weigh in too, and maybe how you approach this kind of thing. But I think, I mean, I don't know if there's like a one tried and true, like best or right way to take notes. It's really about how you listen and how you absorb information. But I would think that, and this is what I do, is I'm usually listening to podcasts on my phone. And so I always have like a notes, pay, you know, like on your iPhone, you've got those like notes, whatever. So I'll always keep one up and ready. And what I do generally is I either put like timestamps. So if I'm not going to like take a, a whole note, like if you or somebody says something really smart or interesting or compelling, I'll kind of note the time that it happens so I can go back and re-listen to that. And I'll take notes of anything that really resonates with me already, like something that, that you said that I'm like, I really want to try this, or I've been thinking about this. And this really kind of confirms what I've already been thinking. And then I'll also, of course, take notes on anything that I don't understand. So if you say something, if he says something that I've never I've never heard the word before. I've never heard of the concept. You mention a person or a book, like I'll take note of that so I can go back. And just sort of being present throughout the entire thing, anything that sort of sticks in your brain, whether it's good or bad, like I don't get this or I don't, this doesn't make sense, or I love this or this makes sense, make those notes, timestamp it so you can go back. Because a lot of people don't have time. Like they think if I want to take notes on a podcast, it means I have to like sit here at my desk and bring out my piece of paper and like write. And people don't generally do that. So I think that that knowing that there's kind of like a quicker, sort of easier, more realistic way if you're doing this while you're going for a walk or you're doing your cardio at the gym or whatever. That's sort of sort of my thought. But I think that people, because the people who listen to your podcast tend to want to do everything optimally, which is great. Don't stress out too much about it, right? Just sort of be an active listener and and take quick, short little notes as things are kind of coming up and sticking in your brain. And then you can kind of go back when you have more time. That's my two cents. But anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I obviously have my approach as well. And it's kind of two pronged for me. So I, I really believe this. I may have a problem with how much information I try to consume. It's like, it's just constant trying to put the pieces of life together. And, and that's from a body perspective, a mind perspective, neuroscience, and then business on top of that. So 
it's just not enough hours in the day for me to consume and, and to learn. So I have this belief, uh, I'll tell you two kind of approaches I take. I have this belief that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So sometimes I've read a book and it didn't really take much from it. And I was like, oh, it's you know, not really resonating with me. And then I'd pick the same book up 12 or 24 months later and it changed my life. It's mind blowing, right? Just depending what you want to focus on, what you're ready for. So if it's the type of information that is really resonating with you, and you're like, okay, I, I want to know more about this, then my suggestion goes as such. My suggestion is you listen to it once all the way through with the intention of just really paying attention. And then you listen to it a second time with your notes open. So the beauty of podcasts and audiobooks is you can actually listen while having a different app open. So the note is open on your phone or your your notebook on you know writing actually is, is open the second time through. And that's usually the way I do it. Like if I listen to podcast that I'm just massively fascinated with. I'll always just listen the first time through and see what catches my ear, not writing anything down, not giving anything else my attention. And the second time through is this attempt to, you know, kind of decode and really pay attention, zero in on things that I want to explore deeper. I mean, if it's if it's worth taking notes, it's worth listening to it twice because you know, there's so much information. We're so distracted. I think it's important that people actually go a little bit deeper, both in their attention paying and their, and their thought process. So that's something I do. And I do that a lot, you know, and I'm, I'm very good. I think now at vetting whether or not this is useful for me or not and listen all the way through. And if there's like one or two things, great. Like you said, timestamps, awesome idea. If it's really resonating with you, then it's certainly worth listening to twice. Was there anything about your interview with Dr. Sinclair, like anything that you learned through that conversation in his book that like fully changed something you were doing? Or was it more just sort of a continuous learning and these things are sort of things I've been mulling over? Like, was there anything he said that you were like, oh, shit, like this is, this is really completely different? Not really. Like, I'm really still skeptical on understanding the implications short and long term of mTOR and AMPK. And I think, you know, they have this camp of people that say, well, you just don't want to stimulate mTOR. And you have this other camp of people that says, well, it's it's not something to think about. And I, I still don't think they have the answer. I just feel like it's way too vague on both sides. Like you have this one camp saying, well, AMPK, I mean, I get the idea of cellular senescence and needing, you know, your body should be breaking down sometimes and it should be building up other times and understanding how that ratio is meant to work. You know, the, this anabolism versus catabolism ratio seems to be relatively poorly understood. There's got to be some way that we can on a deeper level understand it. I've just, and here's how I gauge that. This is my, you know, analytical brain looking at it. When, when you hear somebody who is supposed to be an authority speak on it. If you listen closely to their voice, they almost like tread water. It's almost like trepidation in their voice. So they're not certain. And again, whether or not ignorance can cause certainty is is a different conversation altogether. So it just seems like they're uncertain. They're not quite sure. They're like, oh, it seems like this. And you know, this might be the case. And and we know, like, obviously, I, I completely see the value in, in allowing some type of fasting to happen so that your body goes through these, or at least allows the cellular senescence to occur, right? This program cell death to occur and these cells to not have misfolded proteins, which leads to DNA damage, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't think they have the answer yet. So I'm not quite convinced of the low protein diet that all these guys are living. I don't know, but I, I think quality of life to me means muscle. And again, that could just be my got the goggles I choose to look at life through. It's like, but you see people who are elderly, and the thing that seems to go most is you know even in the in the elderly people who you know live into their nineties and hundreds, the quality of life goes because of their lack of strength, their inability to move. So it's it's strength and complex movement, right? So it's like. I need to be able to walk. I need to be able to breathe. I need to be able to, you know, uh, be very stable in all these unstable positions. And that to me is just strength training and, and strength training comes back to, okay, well, I want to create this acute damage and I need to somehow hopefully maintain muscle. Obviously the amount of muscle I have still is too much. Like I think, not obviously, but I think it's still too much just because of sheer tissue that your body needs to supply energy to and that's causing more oxidative stress and inflammation etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think this idea of just constantly not eating protein is just just a bad idea i just don't think it's a good idea so you know people will argue for veganism or for low protein diets or 
I just don't think it's a good idea. I think, you know, if you look at, you know, my brain goes to this ancestral view, right? So, you know, let's say 50,000 years ago, what was rewarded as human beings? Movement was rewarded, right? So if I was the guy or the girl who was out hunting, walking, running, pursuing, was healthy, I was fit, I was strong, and I got food, and, and that food was usually an animal. And then once you stop moving and pursuing animals, well, you stop getting the cognitive reward of you know, the pursuit, which is the dopamine system. And then you stop getting the, the, the anandamide and, and the endorphin release from actual exercise, and then you ultimately die. But at the end of those pursuits, there was always this celebration and this typically, I'm, I'm presuming this, this kill of, of the animal. And, you know, as soon as that went away from your life, you literally started to wither away and die. And, uh, you know, you're just kind of, now you've become an elder and now maybe you're not going to live as long. I think this idea of exercise being what exercise light and hopefully some type of positive food stimulus being at the end of that, you know, at the light at the end of the tunnel, those three things are, are the most important things we can do as human beings. Vigorous exercise. And there's three types of exercise that I perpetuate, right? It's like you have to be mobile you have to you know so it's this idea of mobility and stability maybe being inseparable and then you want to be strong and then you need to have good aerobic cardiovascular health right so my training now is basically three pronged it's like one day is strength training and muscle building one day is yoga and, and mobility and stability and one day is aerobic training and, and sometimes two in a day but it's always this kind of balance of this trilogy because those three things it seems and if you incorporate light I mean sunlight into that then it seems like you're covering all your bases, right? You're doing everything you need to live a really long life. And I think each of those should be done intensely. And the more intensely you can do them for a list of reasons that's, you know, mile long, the longer you're going to live and the better you're going to live, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. Like there's still, there's still so much work that needs to be done and so much that needs to be unpacked in this conversation. And like some of this research is just still too early. Like we haven't seen an entire group of, or entire generation of individuals who have done this sort of prolonged constant fasting or calorie restriction and how that's worked. And there's like the correlation versus causation, because are the people who are doing this fasting also doing all these other lifestyle factors that may enable them to live longer? And there's all these things. And and then there's the, the, piece that you touched on where it's sort of like quality of life and like if, do you want to tack on an extra 20 years but you're kind of brittle and don't feel that great and hungry all the time and I don't want to sign up for that personally so yeah. I, I still keep going back to and I think this is something that you feel as well the concept of and maybe just because we have the benefit of being relatively young so I'm not like super stressed out about this stuff yet but I'm more concerned about resilience in all facets of life than longevity currently. And that goes with things like metabolic flexibility. And that goes with, like you said, sort of being strong and mobile and being able to move your body the way you want to. And I think that ultimately, that's something that a lot of people should be focusing on. We're all either trying to be like the strongest or the fastest or live forever. And it's like, what about this sort of beautiful sort of positive homeostasis in the middle where you're just, you're resilient and you're flexible and you can kind of just absorb or take whatever comes at you because you've been doing all of these basic health factors that you talk about all the time, the movement, the sunlight, the meditation, the eating properly. When you have all of those ducks in a row, like you just kind of can handle things. And that's that's the goal that I'm always looking for from day to day. Like, do I wake up and fall apart because I have the sniffles or because I had one shitty night of sleep or because I had to eat crappy carbs yesterday because it was the only thing and I ate them? Like, you know, I want to be able to just be flexible and resilient. And I think that that's something that maybe people don't talk about enough because we're always trying to work on the fringes, you know? Like, how long can we go without eating? How hard can we work out and still get up the next day? And it's like, maybe let's just, let's just look at this piece in the middle about just being able able to handle whatever life throws at you, you know, that's, that's where I am anyway. Yeah. And there's a really interesting thought that it's been kind of rearing over the last few days since I've had some time by myself. Every time you think about what should I be eating, how often I sh should I be eating, you're taking your attention off something that's more important, right? Like people who succeed at the highest level don't think about what they're eating, right? They just eat. They're like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat something nourishing. And I think stressing about food or even thinking about food as kind of perpetually as we do as a society is I'm confident intentionally manipulated into the system, right? Like, you know, this even just creating controversy around how to eat does what gets people thinking about food. 
more and more and more. And people, I mean, even people in the fitness industry, especially people in the fitness industry, think and talk about food way too much. And I know it's important, but what if we just said, hey, I don't need to eat three times a day. I just need to eat when I'm hungry. And when I'm hungry, I'm going to make sure I choose wholesome, whole foods. I don't give a shit if it's meat, vegetables, fruit, nuts, whatever. Like in a reasonable amount, when I'm hungry, to satiation. Rather than constantly focusing your attention on, like stressing over how much I'm going to eat, what am I going to eat, what should I eat? I'm not sure what my body needs right now. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, this or this. Listen, I just don't think it matters that much. Like, I mean, obviously it does, but I don't want to downplay it. But I really think as a culture, we just overstate, we just make it a stress, you know, and we just think about it way too much. And people end up over consuming because it's just constantly think you can't get food off your mind, right? Yeah. Everywhere you go, food. Everywhere you move, you turn food. And it's like, hey, man, I'm just going to think about stuff that's kind of more important. Like, you know, I'm going to think about my time with my family. I'm going to think about my massively transformative purpose. And I'm like, I'm going to focus on that. And you see all these amazing entrepreneurs who, I'm going to guess with a pretty high degree of certainty that these people aren't spending 12 hours of their day planning out their what they're going to eat at the next meal or what they're going to eat for the next three days. They're like, hey, here's what I like to eat. Here's the, like the six to 10 foods that I like to eat. Go. Like that's it, right? Like, And I think that's maybe the simplest way to approach this is like, oh, this is how I eat. It's these foods and that's it. And whatever portion is awesome. Like if I want some more, I'll eat some more. If not, that's okay. You know, rather than, than like having to fight about it, like, oh, this way or that way. And like, fuck, just eat good food, man. And again, I hate that I have to almost like fall in this ambiguous zone in the middle of just saying like, stop being so dogmatic. But I really think if you just thought about food less, probably would be in much better shape, right? And as a human being in general, like if, if we just didn't, it was just constantly incessant, like from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep, there's nothing else in your mind but food, you get way more done in your life and probably a lot less overweight and probably a lot, lot more healthy, right? Because it just wouldn't be the constant incessant need to over consume. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you're not consuming a maximum number of calories or an excess of calories, the type of calories don't matter as much, right? If I'm in a caloric deficit, maybe they don't matter as much. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the biggest issue is that what you're talking about and what you're you're sort of trying to teach and saying that this is sort of like a, a nebulous sort of in the middle kind of stance is not the case. It's just that that's how we think about it because, as you said, we have a hard time understanding what reasonable things are, like what a reasonable amount of food or in a reasonable approach to how we eat. Like we can't focus on that. We're much better at focusing on the fringes, on the extremes, on the strict protocols, on things like that. And so talking about about this really holistic approach to life, which is incredibly important and incredibly valuable, we tend to think of it as like, oh, well, we're just kind of, you know, just talking about this stuff in the middle and it's kind of vague. And it's, it's not, it's not. It's just that we have to figure out a way to make that reasonable, intelligent, thoughtful approach sound sexier than like two ways to lose 100 pounds and two weeks. Like, you know what I mean? That's the problem. Sure. Everybody wants the cookie cutter, right? And it's goal-directed oh. behavior too, right? If my goal is building muscle, obviously that's very different than just living a long life. And if my goal is to lose fat, well, that's different too. But man, I've been thinking about that a lot too. And, and you know, it goes back to the, somebody brought up the conversation I had with Phil Ernie yesterday. And, and said, if you don't remember the conversation I had with Phil Ernie, he's a nutritionist of the UK. And he was very dogmatic on the podcast that you know, the only thing that matters in body composition if someone wants to lose fat is just reduce the calories. I think I'm a relatively logical, maybe quasi-intelligent person. I'm like, there's nothing in my soul that says I can agree with that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Like, let's say, Ash, your daily caloric requirement is, I don't know, 2,500 calories. And I say, Ash, you know, I say not you as an example, but let's say anybody. And I say, okay, instead of eating 2,500, let's eat 2,200 or, or 2,000. Now you're going to be in this deficit. How many people can sustain that? Like if, if you're overeating to begin with and, and I say, hey, now we're going to cut you down under your your what your body needs to survive. How many people can sustain that? And why can't they? Because most people have really bad habits around food and they eat because they're stressed. So what does that tell us? Let's just take your calories away. Now being in a caloric deficit, so everyone understands, is also a stress, both psychologically and physiologically a stress to you. Now you've taken away your coping mechanism of stress and thrown another layer of stress in there because that being in a deficit by definition is also a stress. 
So now I've just added more uh, sympathetic stress to your system, therefore more cortisol and no mechanism of allowing you to cope with it. You are like, hey, just suffer, be mentally tough. Good luck. If someone has an overproduction of cortisol and, and they're over inflamed and they're insulin resistant, they're going to be starving and they're going to cheat and then everybody fails and says, oh, now I can't do it. I don't have the confidence to do it. Anyways, I don't want to get into that conversation because it, it's a much longer conversation, but it's important for people to know that I think the worst thing you can do is start just cutting calories. You have to pay attention to where your calories are coming from, follow your hunger signals, and I think most importantly, modulate your autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic stress has to come down, otherwise you're going to keep eating and, and you have to sleep better, right? So remove your stressors, give yourself some coping strategies for stress, and then improve your sleep. Do that first. And if we can do that, I've seen almost with 100% consistency that people just tend to eat less. They tend to think about food less because they're not stressed. Stress is a coping strategy for most people. Or sorry, food is a coping strategy for most people. So if we can just allow you to not be stressed so much, you're not going to eat as much. So Ash, I have to end the podcast because I have somebody else waiting. But I want you to talk about what you're doing now. So you get to take over the Q&A because everyone wants to hear more from Ashley and less from me. So talk about what you're doing now. If you can share it with our audience, I'm going to deke out and Ooh, shut So I down, get to end it? Okay. That's a big you deal. You get to end it. No pressure. And you get to give a shout out to our sponsor. I will do that. All right, Ashley. Thanks, Ben. Actually, I don't even know if I can get off. Can I get off and, and still? I don't know, but let's just make this really quick. I'm going to tease. Oh. We'll talk about it. We can talk about it next week instead. I'm going to tease what my thing is. It has to do with food and delicious meat and organ meat that you are going to enjoy. And I'm going to force you to eat the recipes. And that I'm back muscles. Yeah. And my back muscles, but also feel free before you get off and do another yet another podcast because you're working so hard for all of us, even though it's nighttime where you are. If you want to send any of those like 20 staff that you have working over to Canada to do some recipe development for me and make me some food, I would super appreciate that. Please do that. <laughs> And our sponsor is, just before you jump off, very quickly, Bubs Naturals, who is incredible. They've sent you collagen and MCT oh, across man, the world. So awesome. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No yeah, big deal. Boxes. Oh, man. And I've been using it every day. I mean, my morning coffee, I take MCT and collagen with me everywhere I go. Thank you so much to Bubs. You know, literally, guys, if you've ever tried Bubs, go out and try it because it literally is the best and I'm not blowing smoke. It's significantly better than another MCT and collagen. And as soon as you try, you'll know why. If you drink coffee, put it some MCT and collagen in your coffee. It dissolves. It tastes amazing. It's creamy. You put other MCTs. I tried to buy MCT here. I'll be honest. And it was terrible. And I literally reached out to you. I was like, Ash, please tell Bubs to, to send me some stuff. And they hooked me up. Yeah, they crushed and it. So and nobody gives a better discount than those guys. That's the other thing. Like, look, if we're just caring about dollars and cents here, I don't know anybody who's willing to give a 20% discount. So that's pretty good. So code intelligence, right? All caps, intelligence, 20% off, whatever you want. Pretty good deal. Wow. And they give 10% of profit to charity, which means they're probably breaking even or, or not even, which is incredible. Huge shout out to bubsnaturals.com. Use the code intelligence because you're awesome. They're awesome. Ash, I love you. I appreciate you. Have an amazing day. Thanks, Ben. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.